So we're really excited to have John Stanmeyer with us today to talk about the Out of Eden project, along with printing, paper, um, exhibition, all the good stuff. John is an award-winning photographer, filmmaker, educated, uh, educator dedicated to social, humanitarian, and political issues that define our times. For more than 15 years, John has worked nearly exclusively with National Geographic magazine, producing over 18 stories, resulting in more than 14 covers. Between 1998 and 2008, John was a contract photographer for Time magazine. His years with Time resulted in 18 covers and more than 100 stories. He is the recipient of numerous honors, including the prestigious uh, Robert Kappa Award, POI Magazine Photographer of the Year, and the World Press Photo of the Year. John lives in the Berkshires in Massachusetts with his dog. I thought it was one dog, but I think it's multiple dogs um, who you'll probably see running around in the background throughout the webinar, which is fun. So thank you, John Stanmeyer, so much for joining us today. Um, it's gonna be a really fun, interesting webinar. Hi, Paige. Thank you so much for um, asking me and, and to do this, and I'm thrilled to be here. And thank you to however many people are here. I have no idea who are kind enough to take part of their, I think it's Wednesday, um, part of their afternoon off to, uh, to join us. So um, yeah, thankful to be here and, and hope to share, you know, the, the sort of simplistic beauty um, and the complex beauty of storytelling. Um, and yeah, uh, actually printing to make it sort of a tangible thing. Yeah, we'll go through the full story um, and then we will get to the printing. And like I said, the chat is um, on your screen. So feel free to ask us any questions, any comments. I know that we have some really great conversations in that chat. So please feel free to use that. Um, so John, I know we're gonna start out with talking all about this, the Out of Eden project, which you've been working on for, I think, how many years now? Um, Out of Eden has been going on, I think we're into our seventh or eighth year. Um, Paul Salopek, who is, is uh, the writer and a dear friend and, uh, and the actual walker. Um, gosh, you know, I should have given you a map of, of what we're doing, but everything at the geographic is about maps too. Um, but we're, we left Ethiopia um, in the Horn of Africa um, in January 2013, um, and we're following uh, literally the bone fragments of our ancestors. Whether we can, you know, we need maybe. A, well, we got some doggies talking. Um, we uh, we we literally um, walked to populate our planet as we are. Um, and we'd almost need a whole hour long presentation to discuss it, um, but uh, whether we want to uh, debate it endlessly or not, we all trace our ancestors to a region of the world, our great grandparents by about 2,500 generations um, to a region uh, that we call today um, Ethiopia in, in northern Ethiopia in the Afar region. And so Paul, um, it, Paul, this is Paul's project um, that he owns it, but the National Geographic Society, the magazine are, are, are significant funders of it, the Pulitzer Center, the Neiman Foundation, the Abundance Foundation. It's very expensive to do this, um, not money in pocket for, for Paul or even me, really, but it's uh, the infrastructure to be able to slow down, and Paul wants to slow down and, um, and, and follow slow journalism and get to know humanity that's around us of who we are today, some 2,500 generations. We're about, we walked, we, we, we walked out of what we call today Africa, or again, the Horn of Africa, about 50 to 70,000 years ago. So uh, to you and I and the kind people that are here, may know your, your, of course, you'll know your parents, uh, uh, you'll know maybe your grandparents, you may not know your great, 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 great grandparents, um, but you will not know your great, great, great by the power of 2,500 grandparents back. Uh, it's really probably the most profound story I've ever worked on because it connects us all as sisters and brothers. So apologies for Elfrida. Hold on a second. Hey, Frida, come on, big love. Come here, come. You're a goofball. 
Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so and so Paul has walked uh, uh, through 16 countries. I've walked around, he's walked 11,000 miles. Um, I've walked about 500 uh, because the story is not about Paul. There has to be one uh, image of Paul in every issue of the magazine, but it's not about Paul. It's a story that's about all of us. And, and so how do you photograph something that, you know, has been taking place continually to this day in migration um, uh, for the last 50 to 70,000 years? Uh, so it's, it's really a narrative of who we are today as sisters and brothers on earth. This is the only place we can live. Um, and that's the, really the, the cumulative power of, of any story, but especially this story. Yeah, that's amazing. Paul's, so in, China, Paul's in China right now. So we've, we've literally traversed all the way uh, to mainland China. And once COVID restrictions ease, I'll be, um, Paul got in before the, the, the country locked down. Um, and, uh, but I'm waiting and the, the Disney, uh, which now owns National Geographic is, politely working the, the system to get me on in, um, uh, maybe even during the, the COVID lockdown. So I hope, 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 hope to uh, be joining Paul again soon. Wow. And I'm going to share my screen so we can go through some of these images that you have taken. Um, and you can tell us a little bit about each image. And as I do that, so does, does Paul have his entire journey mapped out or is this, um, he's walking and he's going to see where he it kind of takes him? Uh, no, it's, it's, well, nothing is mapped out, but again, I wish I would have, um, if we had a moment or when it gets to that ability, I'm actually going to try to pull it up, uh, a, a map here of the walk, the, the original intended walk, um, but what ended up happening is uh, that when we began this, you know, enormous mass migration that, that was a trickling of us, of our ancestors, um, we didn't have borders. Uh, we didn't have these invisible lines um, that uh, that separate us, that, that, that divide us. And, um, and, and so the reality is we are up against, we thought we'd be already in the tip of Argentina by now, which is our ending point uh, of the walk. That's the, the, the end of the continental land masses before you would need some sort of flotation or boat to, uh, to traverse to an, to an island. Um, but as I mentioned, we, um, we didn't have borders. So one of our biggest impediment, uh, impediment for, for moving uh, across our planet has been these oftentimes really evil, treacherous lines that only humans create uh, called borders. Um, and uh, we were supposed to walk through Iran. Uh, I've been to Iran before, so I, I've, I've received the visa and it's, it's welcoming enough to, to come on in. Um, and it's a really beautiful country. Um, but it's, uh, the reality is we, there was some political madness nonsense going on uh, here in this country and we couldn't get our visa. So, we, so Paul had to walk all the way over the Caspian Sea which added years uh, of, uh, of, of extra walking. So we're way behind schedule. Can I quickly show my screen? Is that all right? Just so- Yeah, absolutely. I hope sharing mine. I you... be, am I able to do it? Do I have the powers of powernesses? Hold on. You do, yes. Yeah. So at the bottom, there's a share, green share okay. screen button. So here we go. So sorry, you're gonna see yourself. Okay, so uh, this is just the presentation here. Uh -oh, why am I? beach balling here. Here, I'm going to show you something and now I'm spinning. Oh, here we go. Okay, so uh, this is the route. Sorry, I'm not doing it in full screen because then I, well, I'll do it in full screen. Um, and this is the path that we were going to walk, um, going under the Caspian, as you can see. Um, we had to go way over it. Uh, and again, because of borders uh, and waiting for visas and access and then COVID, Oopsie, I want to pause this so that you can actually understand the magnitude of, of what, we're, what we're doing. So we started here in the Afar region of Ethiopia 50, 60, 70,000 years ago. Some of our ancestors walked south, some walked to the, to the west, but many uh, wandered up uh, across what used to be land bridges across what we call the, the Red Sea. 
um, uh, there's cave paintings uh, in southern Spain or southern France, I can't remember now southern, the, which country, that date back about 23,000 years. Um, so it took about 20,000 years to, to sort of make it here. Um, and when we look at our bone fragments uh, in this part of the hemisphere, what we call North America, there used to be a land bridge uh, between what we call today Russia and, and Alaska. And, uh, and our ancestors walked uh, and the, the oldest homo sapien bones on earth uh, in North America are found here in the Inuit communities of, of present day Alaska, Canada. And they're only 13,000 years old. And then we were following the, again, the, the, the bone trail and the, the, the oldest homo sapien bones at the tip of Argentina are only 7,000 years old. So it took about uh, 43,000 to uh, 60 some thousand years to, uh, to, to finally have homo sapiens, human beings, um, reach the southernmost landmass. Um, mm -hmm. so, so Paul right now is right here near Yunnan. So we've walked this length of the walk in the last seven plus years. And here, as you see, we would we put in the in the early maps, National Geographic made that we would be in Tierra de Fuego uh, in 2020. Well, it's we're 2021. Um, you know, thank you, COVID, and, and thank you, borders. So, um, so that's how do I unscreen share? So I hope that helped those of you that are watching or don't know the Out of Eden walk. That's the magnitude and the beauty and the love that the story is about of connecting the, these finite tissues of our finite existence of our simple humanity. Yeah, that's incredible. So does he have a, an estimate of when he expects to make it to the finish line? Um, so he's now entered the longest continental one country, not continental, one country landmass, China. Uh, that'll take about 18 months to two years. Um, we're estimating uh, once we hit North America, it should, it, there'll be no more visa issues to probably deal with. Um, uh, and a lot of people don't understand, of course, because um, Paul has animals that carry his belongings, especially in the beginning. So when uh, we wanted to walk across uh, Uzbekistan, for example, um, it, it took months for them to understand, well, why do you want to walk with a mule across Uzbekistan? Um, uh, Saudi Arabia, Paul and I were literally given the keys to the kingdom by the royal family um, because the son, uh, one of the sons, actually understood the importance of the story. And it wasn't since T.E. Lawrence and the Arab Revolt 100 plus years ago that uh, non-Saudi and non-Muslim had the freedom to walk across Saudi Arabia. Paul and I traversed the entire length of Saudi Arabia freely uh, with, with no minders or anything. Um, and that takes time. And, and so moving forward, we shouldn't have these logistical hurdles to solve, um, but probably another seven years, seven to eight years. Wow. Wow. Okay, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen so we can look at some of the images that you did take along your journey. All right, do you see it? Oh uh, yeah, here, yeah. Okay, so that's great. actually Paul in Ethiopia, probably the second week of the walk. Um, the beginning of the walk, I, I, I probably spent probably the most time with Paul uh, of the more than two months that that uh, first chapter one of Out of Eden took. We didn't know what to expect. It was a very long immersion, two months straight, a little over two months to, to walk through mo all of Northern uh, Ethiopia and Djibouti. Um, and this is probably the, the second week. And I would meet up with Paul periodically because I wanted to make sure that uh, I, I was understanding and giving to the story as, as you know, beneficially as I could. Uh, this is a very um, late afternoon, uh, I'm forgetting now the name of the village, um, but this is Paul with, with, he had three camels because there's other people uh, walking with him, uh, local guides, uh, herdsmen, uh, uh, women who are farmers will, will, will be his guide. Um, he doesn't speak all the languages. 
uh, and he has a general footpath that he'll go in, but nothing is like, uh, because we don't follow roads, we do everything humanly possible to avoid uh, human created um, uh, avenues, so to speak. Now we're not going to like necessarily say, "Oh, there's a mountain over there. Let's you know try to find the most complex way to traverse that mountain." Uh, but we try to take footpaths um, or animal paths uh, once in a while, roads. But the, the sounds of cars are just you know dreadful like safety issues. So um, we zigzag. We 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 meander with a general idea of narratives that we want to tell, and find the geographic locations and and history. Uh, past history, present history, and, and possible future um, history uh, to tell again the stories of, of who we are. Uh, and we're showing, just so that everyone is aware, uh, that this is a massive project. Again, uh, I haven't, I, I wasn't in, uh, in, in Azerbaijan um, or Georgia, I saw Paul in Georgia, uh, I, Burma, Myanmar, couldn't get in. Um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, one of my dear friends did that leg of the journey because he spoke Pashtun and, and, and knew the, the, the actual uh, passageway over the mountains. Um, but uh, this is what ran in this month's issue or the November issue, next, next month's issue. There's over 200 and some thousand photographs so far uh, from the Out of Eden Walk, thousands of films uh, and hundreds of, of field recordings. And this was maybe the fifth night in the Afar. Um, there's no light pollution, no human encroachment of human-made things. Um, and uh, the uh, Afari, Afari teenagers were, were doing a call and response, a singing chant and dance under the stars. And it was just absolutely beautiful. Yeah. You said this is, in November was the ninth chapter? The ninth chapter comes out uh, next month. I, it, it is available on newsstands just now. And, and if you subscribe to the, the paper version of it, um, it should be in your mailbox as of two days ago. My copy arrived two days ago. Um, uh, this is a somewhat known photograph. This is in Djibouti, um, where I was, it was my second day in Djibouti. And my dear friend and, 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 and translator, guide in Djibouti, Stanislas, thought I was tired and, and said, oh, you must be tired. Don't you want to, you know, you've been traveling for over a month in Ethiopia, overland and walking. Don't you want to just go back to your hotel and, and take a rest? I'm like, no, the light gets beautiful at night and let's just walk. And, and we were walking along the Red Sea and really just getting to know each other, walking sort of in the direction of this simple hotel I was staying in called the Hotel Dar es Salaam. And, uh, and maybe like an hour of walking, I go, Stanislas, what are all these people standing here with their phones in the air, shaking them in the air? And, and of course, he sees it all the time. Um, and he says, oh, well, these are people from Somalia, Somaliland. And they pick up a SIM card from Somalia in, in, the, in the black market. And if they stand in this one spot and shake their phones in the air, they do what's called catching to try to catch a signal in neighboring Somalia. And if they're lucky enough to catch the signal, it has some of the least expensive um, mobile phone rates on our on the planet, and they can talk to their loved ones who already emigrated or made their way further in, into Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Middle East, Europe, and onward. And I was just flabbergasted that that this is migration today. This is exactly what our ancestors did. Of course, not with technology. Um, when you left. Uh, and even 20, 30 years ago, we, we definitely didn't have this technology. But um, uh, today, it, it is this, this link that we have to our loved ones. Uh, and I met, you know, I talked to most of these people. Um, uh, they were trying to get a signal from Somalia to speak, you know, to their family that were already in Sweden, finding out if their you know, immigration papers were getting ready. They're all in the act of migration for a, a, a hope, opportunity, and a better life. No different than our ancestors some 50, 70,000 years ago were competing for resources with other biped species um, and most likely looking for food and, and potable water. Wow, it's amazing. 
This is in Saudi Arabia, uh, outside of Jeddah, and uh, now forget the name of this uh, area, but it's a, uh, all the buildings are 150, 200 years old. They're really the old romantic uh, sort of scene, theater scene of Saudi Arabia, and all the buildings are listing over literally to the left and the right, and people still live in them, and it's just beautiful. And, you know, I, I'm always looking for sort of whimsical tomes that really maybe mean nothing but come in a lyrical way full circle to show who we are today and modernity and, and, and antiquity um, and I just sort of like colors and strangenesses. This is also in, in, in Saudi Arabia. These are the, the Nebatean ruins. Um, most, I don't expect everyone to understand the Nebateans and the history of the Nebatean rule some, I don't know, 5,000 years ago. Uh, but it, it, you'll know it from Jordan, in the country of Jordan, uh, in, in Petra. I'm sure many people have heard of Petra. It was uh, in the closing end of the first Indiana Jones movie when Harrison Ford and Sean Connery bumble, or Sean Connery sort of bumbles out on his horse, and you see the, the, this ancient uh, structure called the Treasury in Jordan, in Petra, um, carved in the background. Well, the Nebateans uh, was a vast kingdom that, that stretched all the way into present day Saudi Arabia. And these uh, uh, carvings, these, these are tombs, um, are probably the finest uh, remains of Nebatean ruins because there's hardly any tourism in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the, these are massive structures all carved by hand. And, and these here scattered in the desert, hundreds of them, um, looked as if they were carved you know, a week ago when I, when I was there, it's just astonishing. Uh, were you able to go inside? Oh yes, yes, yeah. But it, 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 it's more the exterior architecture. These were these were tombs. These were graves, the tombs uh, in Petra. It's a whole complex. It was like a city um, uh, where there is this place called the Treasury that would be like I guess a, today's equivalent of a bank, and there were governance and things like that. The Nebateans were were, were quite a quite a, a well developed society some three thousand to five thousand years ago. Wow. Uh, this is meeting up uh, in Paul in Petra. This is now where if, if we were to be able to hover over that cliff behind him there, uh, where that sort of taller mountain is in the background, uh, that's Petra back there. These are wind blown, wind carved mountains that are just gorgeous. Uh, and now Paul in Jordan, in, in Djibouti, Ethiopia and Saudi Arabia, he used a camel uh, in Djibouti, in camels. In Djibouti, he used a mule. Uh, and I met up with him through satellite phone uh, as he was nearing to, and I found him in the middle of this vastly gorgeous landscape uh, using GPS coordinates, because I'm not with him all the time. Um, and then followed him uh, for about a half a day till we, we reached Petra. Wow. Uh, this is in Jordan also. Um, these are uh, the beginning of the Syria crisis in Syria was, was was really in its somewhat early stages. Uh, there were around 150,000 Syrians already living in Jordan. Um, and they had, uh, they, they were fed up, many of them were fed up living in refugee camps. This is uh, 2014, before the, the big migration that we saw took place during 2016, 2017, and, and still continuing today. Um, and, uh, and, and many were just fed up living in refugee camps because it's just terribly depressing and stagnant. And, uh, and hundreds would take their tents that the UNHCR gave them and move further south to, to work in the agriculture industry. Uh, and, and they replaced the already, Syrians replaced the already cheap labor from Egypt because they're so desperate, they'll work for even less. Uh, in this case, also children are working in the fields uh, picking tomatoes um, that are shipped all over Jordan and out into Europe. Are you allowed to publish people's faces or do you have to get permission for that? No, we, we think I, I, you can get releases and I always try to have releases, but it has to be in local language. I'm not gonna, I know I've read stories of some people handing you know, releases in, in not the native language. Um, but everyone is very welcoming. It's editorial. I cannot sell this commercially. I can't put text all over it and you know, sell for a 
tomato company or anything like that. I never would. I wouldn't even like, I'm literally thinking of total, absolute absurd nonsense. But in the editorial world, um, uh, it, it, ethically, you're, it, it's not an issue, but I'm always very watchful. I explain why I'm there. I spoke to his mother. Um, they understood why I'm there because they were frustrated at the situation in Syria and frustrated that the world wasn't paying attention. Yeah. Uh, this is now in Petra. I guess I sent you maybe too many from Jordan. Uh, there, these are uh, also, uh, this is very walking distance, maybe 15, 20 minutes from the treasury in Petra. Uh, there's still uh, nomads, families living in uh, the, the tombs uh, that were former tombs, but are, are like cave homes uh, in these most magical landscape mountains in Jordan. Uh, it's a UNESCO heritage site and, and the government's trying to get uh, people to move out of it, but uh, what a magnificent place to live. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, in Turkey, um, Syrian refugees, uh, now we're in the beginning of the mass madness that, that uh, took place and continues still to take place. Uh, this is a family of two boys and they're just sort of goofing around and looking out the window because there was a musicians passing by. But uh, I think we ran, we ran this in, in this month's, um, next month's issue in the, in the story that came out, I think in 2015, 2016, um, we didn't uh, publish this one, we published another one. Is each chapter in the National Geographic about a certain location or is it about a certain story that happens in that time or what is each issue based on? It's based on geography, just because that's the, 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 the narrative of the Out of Eden walk sort of flows on a, on a chapter basis ba based upon the geography that we're walking in. Um, but here was a, a, became a news story. This was a, a, actually this day, I spent the first two weeks uh, doing sort of the entrenched refugee story. And then I met up with Paul in, in central Turkey uh, near near the, the mountain called Nemrut, and, uh, and waking up very early. We sleep out in the open uh, most of the time. Sometimes I'll have a tent, Paul will have a tent, but most of the time uh, Paul and myself will just sleep out in the open too if it's warm enough. Uh, and Paul is waking up and there's his now white mule. I think it was a horse at that point. Um, and then I caught word that there was uh, around uh, 5,000 Syrians amassing at the border with Turkey because ISIS was just making news in our global consciousness. And they had invaded the town of, of um, Kobani, which is a massive city in, in Syria. So I think the next frame, if this defaults in the sequential order, yeah. Um, so I, I saw an email and I jumped in the car. I said, Paul, I, you know, I wanna see what this is about. Um, and uh, drove really, really fast, maybe too fast. And uh, there were about, at that point, about 10,000 people amassed at the border. And so became over a 24 hour period, uh, 250,000 people crossing into Syria or what was the largest mass migration uh, in this part of the world since the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the Armenian genocide brought you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of Armenians fleeing in the other direction into Syria, Lebanon, Iran, uh, and parts of the Middle East. So you know, history repeats itself. Humanity is, is just the most weakest, evilest species to each other. A dust devil was coming through um, uh, right at the border. And I'd seen them in the distance all the time. I thought, wow, that's really cool, a tornado of dust. Um, and then I was there, you know, with thousands of people moving and uh, I'm like, oh, this is getting closer. Oh, this is really getting closer. Wow, look at that. Oh my gosh, it's like coming right at us. Uh, and it just blasted right through us. It was just probably the most magical thing I, I'd been swept into. Wow. Uh, this is in Armenia. Uh, um, it has nothing to do with the story. Uh, <laughs> most of what I do has nothing whatsoever to do with, with the story. Uh, I just get excited and interesting with everything. And, and, uh, and here were all of these from the Soviet era, the Soviet times in, in Armenia, um, all these uh, external um, uh, uh, gas pipes everywhere. And we were in this village uh, near a town called Zovasar. 
that was all populated by a uh, hundred years ago by uh, people who came from Turkey in, into Armenia. Uh, and um, and I just love these pipes and I love the Russian ladas and it has nothing to do with the story. It's never been published in the magazine, but I use these for sort of meditation moments to understand why I'm even there and, and sort of a, a mental journey to take me into the sort of fascination of everything around me. Yeah. Do you choose the images that do get published or is that chosen by someone else? It, it's the last publication existing. I think Life Magazine was a bit like that. In my days of when I was on contract with Time, I had some say, but at National Geographic, we have an equal say with incredibly talented photo editors. So uh, we, we do not delete anything or with film, you wouldn't you know put a nail through it or anything like that, right? Um, and you ship everything in to the magazine. And we make our own sort of, we do a keyword called my NGM edit, run on sentence, my NGM edit. Uh, and I make a, a pretty liberal, loose first edit in the field or when I'm back in studio. And then the editors that we get to collaborate with, again, are just so gifted. Um, and they will look at our my NGM edit, find all of that, start, you know, feeling that edit and maybe working it up the editing food chain, so to speak. And then they'll go through everything to find those little special nuggets that we don't see. And that's what a great editor does. And then we sit down and we, yeah, we don't ever argue. I mean, I don't, but we'll, yeah, sometimes you, 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 you wrestle politely and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, but you're in the, in the, what goes in the magazine and online, especially in the magazine, you're telling a story. It's not about us. It's not about, oh, I went to Armenia. Oh, I went to Turkey. Oh, I went to Ethiopia. Look at all these you know, cool pictures that I took or whatever. It has nothing to do with that. I am there to tell a story. It's not about me. It's about everyone that allowed me into their world. And it's about me just being a, a conduit to tell inevitably what most of the stories are, not all of them I do for the magazine, are very complicated narratives that connect all of us. So it's not it's not about me. It, it, you look for the the edit of, for this case, let's say that the laundry waving in the wind uh, as a storm over Turkey is entering into Armenia, and you look for you know are the legs of the children's clothes dancing you know politely and interestingly, or you know with Paul walking which one gives the most you know, lyrical feeling uh, possible, but you can feel it and a great editor will, will shepherd you with it. And, and in the end, you have to let things go. And, and, and in other times, you also get to see almost what you feel the story will be. But it, it, we're talking 20 to 40 pages, um, depending on the length of the story. And so much has to fall to the editing floor. I mean, you know, each chapter can be 15,000 to 20,000 photographs you know, created over a two month period. And you're going to, you're thankful if 10 of them get in the magazine. Right. I'd rather have Sometimes. only 10 and then, then 20 really small trying to cram it in. It's not about quantity, it's about, it's about giving. Right. And sometimes the outside perspective kind of helps, I guess. Yeah, because you're too buried in the story. You're too connected. Yeah. I, I need a great editor. I need a partner. I need somebody who, who believes in me and will hold me and guide me. I use this analogy maybe too much, but it's the only way I can explain it. So if anybody's here who's been on my Ask Me Anything series on Instagram or, or, or some of the YouTube things that are floating around where, where I may have mentioned this, my apologies. But um, an editor, a partner in, in, in life almost, but a partner in editing is somebody who is like a great conductor. And on every project that we do, and I think this holds true in every facet of photography, any genre of photography, uh, but definitely in, in deep, complicated uh, storytelling, we are asked to play every instrument in an orchestra. 
And that instrument, we have to play it at that moment at the highest frequency possible that we can play that instrument, we can perform that instrument. But we need a great conductor to make all these instruments that we play come together as a cohesive symphony or as a cohesive score of music. And that's what a great editor does, is, is it, it, our dance in the field is super incredibly important because all the history that ever was and all the history that'll ever be, this moment of these three women praying at a, at, at a sacred tomb in Uzbekistan, in Kazakhstan, um, will never be that way, right? There, there may be other people that come there. It could even be those three women again, but the lighting will be different. The vegetation will be different. It'll never ever be that way. And, and so our dance of giving is, is all pouring from us at that moment. We have to be in a very high frequency or, or a giving understanding of why we're there. And then all of that, those visual lyrics need to be with a great conductor or somebody we trust, a great partner to guide us to separate ourselves from the story so that the outpouring of the story becomes the most profound and meaningful to those who are, we're, we're trying to give to. Uh, this is in Kazakhstan also. Uh, a family in a, the oil-rich uh, Aktau region in Mangastau, uh, Western um, Uzbekistan. And, you know, I, I don't want to always show people's faces. I mean, I have lots of photographs of, I forget her name now, but I just thought it was a really sweet moment uh, as she was preparing food for us because you it's such beautiful South Asian, uh, Central Asian hospitality uh, where you're invited into a home and they bring you food. Uh, and she was also preparing food for the family. Uh, so we were there kind of at this odd moment of lunch and her daughter had just woken up from a nap uh, under the kitchen table. Uh, this is in Uzbekistan, uh, nearing uh, Afghanistan, at a, really the beginning or, or the middle of the Silk Road. So this chapter, I think it was chapter six, <coughs> was about the Silk Road. Um, and it's, it's just a really lively market where you know, people no longer walk, but they use public transportation and, you know, money's being changed hands and people are talking to each other and hugging each other and all the trees in the window of the yellow bus. And it's a simple frame, but um, I don't know, I just, I don't really like anything that I do, but I can, I have a feeling for this one. And what camera are you using for, do you use the same camera for all of these or do you stick it? Um, I use, uh, well, I use, the, the, the camera that makes phone calls. Uh, I use an iPhone um, a lot and I use Canon. Um, uh, uh, what do I use? Uh, a Mark IV. Uh, and I'm looking to shift into the new mirrorless or whatever they're called. Um, I tested one recently from, from Canon and was absolutely taken to another universe in incredible low extreme, low light extreme ISO. Um, and so uh, I think when, when China opens up uh, in, in the coming month or two, uh, I'll, I'll shift into the, the mirrorless. But to me, they're, they're, they're just tools, Paige, and I, mm -hmm. I'm not a tech person. Do you ever take like Instagram, um, like stories of like videos of what's going on there? Or are you strictly looking for photographs? No, no, I, oh my gosh, it's such an interesting thing to say. Um, uh, I get distracted all the time. I, I'm, I'm the perpetual distractor. Um, and uh, I am absolutely in love and empowered and in this absolute giving of this thing we call Instagram stories. Really, it's, it's publishing, it's self-publishing. Um, and, uh, and so I'm constantly photographing and filming vertical video. My gosh, I, I, I look forward to doing a, a, a whole exhibition soon on plasma screens of, of um, vertical video vignettes. Uh, and I will just go absolutely bonkers, like go completely lucid. And then I have to catch myself going, oh my gosh, I, I got to do you know the photography for this story because it has nothing to do with what I'm doing. I mean, it does, it does. Um, uh, so I'm, I, I'm always behind various, I'm always holding various cameras, whether it's the camera that's hanging on a 
string or a strap or whatever you call that on my shoulder or the camera that's uh, in my shirt pocket or, or back pants pocket. Um, I'm, I'm interacting with them constantly. And I'd probably say more so with the, the, the camera that's in my shirt pocket. I have to catch myself to go wake up, John. You know, you, you can't just keep filming, you know, drops of water or sparkly light or, you know, beautiful strangeness is going on. I have to merge myself back of why I'm here. But I do all of that because I find this to be, a, I find it to be an incredible sort of chemical energy discharge in my brain and my body um, to, to go into these other places so that I really actually can understand the narrative of the stories that I'm working on. Yeah. Um, now we're in, in India. Um, and these again are the images that went in the magazine because there's a whole lead up to this November issue. It's, it's a late in the evening at a rice processing center in, the, in Punjab uh, in Northwest India. Nothing special, but uh, a portrait of a very kind gentleman. Oh, these ran together as a, as a diptych. Uh, yeah, uh, looking at labor on, on how, you know, in large countries of large population, there, there isn't a lot of work opportunities, and how this gentleman makes a living carrying a, a parasol that's lit up with sparkly, you know, plastic diamonds or whatever uh, for weddings along uh, the road that are like parade events that, that take place during wedding season in India. Right. Uh, and this is now uh, nearing the Burma border at, a, at an all girls school um, in, in Assam state. Uh, it's really extremely patriarchal uh, state. Um, and the school is, is very dedicated to educating women to empower them in this enormously male dominated patriarchal part of India. And, uh, and really they're just a, a force to reckon with these, these young women are, are, are really the future of India. Wow. All the images we have. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And like I said, if anyone has questions about the images or, or anything that we talked about, feel free to put these in the- still here. I hope, I hope this is interesting for anyone. Yeah. Well, so you do you. have a question. Um, uh, so, this is from Anthony and he says, John, my sister and I are big on ancestry DNA research and have been tracing our roots for 10 years now. You start to realize we are all more similar than we are different. Have you taken any DNA tests yourself? And if so, what are the results? Secondly, if you are interested, check out My True Ancestry. It's a very interesting site that digs deeper into your DNA. Ah, well, Anthony, uh, yes and no. So uh, about five years, right when I started the walk, um, National Geographic was still doing what was called the Genome Project, where they were also doing uh, swabs of, of your mouth on this you know, little applicator thing that you'd nail in. And I totally forgot where I put it. And then about six months ago, when I moved into this, this house that I'm in, um, I found it in, in a box in the basement. I'm like, oh, great, I'm going to do it. And I, and I put it in, put it in my mouth. And then I went online and they stopped doing the genome testing. <laughs> they, they stopped the, the genome project. So I was like, oh no. Um, but uh, yeah, I looked, I, 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 I'll probably do it through ancestry.com or mytrueancestry.com. The reality is this, uh, Anthony, is um, you and I are, are brothers. Uh, we're just separated by a certain number of grandparents going back. Um, we all have a bit of Neanderthal in us. Um, because Homo sapiens did uh, breed, have sex with Neanderthals, um, a bit of complicated paleoanthropologic background of how that happened or why that happened. This is the venue for that. Um, but, uh, but the reality is um, you and I, I don't know what part of the world you're, uh, Pisa Ferrato, you're, so your Italian ancestry, um, uh, I'm gonna presume, uh, I used to live in Italy, so I, I kind of know the Italian names. And um, yeah, you'll probably be able to go back a few generations in, in, the, in, in just on paper. But your DNA, I'm sure your results uh, connect you back to um, uh, the Horn of Africa. Uh, and the only reason why we look differently on the outside is because of breeding and geography. 
Yeah, I think there's also 23 in me, which is a similar. Yeah, that's another 23 in me. Yeah, because of the number of chromosomes. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think all of us should do that. I'm, I'm not like, I'm curious, sure, like anybody else, but I know, I don't know anything, right? And I love that I don't know anything. Um, but I do know, and I love it, and it's not even having to accept it. I know that I come from a place, just like you, just like every one of us, uh, th that we call today uh, Africa. And, and uh, the reality is just that. Yeah, it's interesting. Should we talk about printing? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Just, then you wrote, oh, and Greek, okay. So, and you know, the Greeks are yeah. gonna, oh, I don't, I, I used to be married to a Greek in all love and kindness, so, you know, the Greeks, the Greeks, the Greeks. Um, but everybody goes back to a certain period of time. People didn't just magically appear in this bordered off area we call Greece today. They walked there before there was ever the word, before even the language of Greek was even invented or begun. Uh, so it, it, you really got to go beyond all this. We, I, we all do, I'll include myself in this, uh, all this nationalism. Um, it, it's what divides us. Yeah. Um, sorry. So uh, there was another question here. So we should jump in it before we talk about printing. Very interesting printed in front of Great. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Ken. Any questions more about it? So that we, I guess we're going to get a little technical here. And I'm, I'm really terrible with tech. So. But that's okay. We don't have to get technical. I think there's also such an interesting idea about, you know, your process in the printing and what you do with your prints and why you think it's important to take it off the screen and into your hand. So I see you have two printers behind you. What kind of printers uh, are you using? Yeah, so I use a, a Canon over here. I think it's the, oh God, I'm terrible at it. Uh, it's the Imograph uh, 1000, Pro 1000. Um, it, will, it will print uh, up to a, 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 a A2 plus. I know it more in the metric size, uh, the European size, A2 plus size in, in US, UK numbers. Uh, I can do a, a, a 22 uh, by 15 inch print if the paper is that big. I print the 20 by 13s, that's the full frame size. I can actually show you what, what I could, what, what prints on there. Uh, so this uh, would be, a, a, this I printed on that printer. Uh, this is with Moab paper also. It, it, it should be known and I, I, I'm always open and transparent. I've collaborated for years with Moab paper um, I'm not here to sell you on Moab paper, but I'm here to passionately and ethically and honestly tell you that I use it because it's brilliant and I don't want to have to think about uh, profiles and all this other stuff that I haven't got a clue what it means. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so, so this, this print is 20 by 13 inches. And now I don't know what that is in centimeters. Uh, and that's printed over there. And then I have a a 60 inch um, uh, roller printer, archival roller printer. There, there's Asia in the back there. Um, mm -hmm. And I use that for up to 60 inch prints. Um, they're both, you know, very much, I guess you'd say dialed in or whatever the word is called, where I don't have to think too much because the I'm not interested in getting technical in the photography that I do. I want to I work in the art, in, in, in the gallery world. I used to own a gallery. I just recently sold the building, but I now move, uh, I, I sold it because I, I, I do all, most of my personal, all my personal uh, gallery work, print work on my website. Um, and so I've been in the, and, and then for exhibitions and museums. Um, so I print a lot um, uh, and, and know it well enough to know that you don't have to know all the technical aspects if you're using the right tools of it. Uh, and it really does become, not because we're here with Moab, everyone, but it really, it, it comes with the paper. Uh, and, and no question, this thing is called Juniper, right? Juniper yeah. rag or whatever. Th this, this is a, a, a throwaway because I goofed up on something with it so I can touch it. Normally I'd never touch it this way. 
But um, it's if any of you worked in the wet darkroom universe, you'll know, you know, like Ilford fiber base paper, this juniper barata, I think is what it's called. Barata, uh, yeah. Beretta, as well. I'm terrible even at pronouncing it. Um, uh, it's like fiber-based paper, and uh, and so both of these printers next to me, there, I can do a, I can do little tiny prints on this thing too, but it, it just, it's just, I can do it a lot more efficiently over here. And before you you started to use the juniper, you also used the LaSalle, I believe, right? Use the LaSalle for many years, and and I like that too. Um, it, it, on the LaSalle, it prints a little, not like more crispier, but I don't know, contrasty, I guess. Con not contrasty is a problem of contrast, but contrastier. And then I just, in my, I guess my airheadedness, I didn't know, or maybe you didn't have the juniper yet, or maybe you did, and I just was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And, um, but when I, when I started using the juniper, I was like, oh my God, I mean, this is like, I'm in a wet dark room again. And, and I'm not even just doing black and white, I'm doing color. And it's everything that I see on the screen and everything that I felt in, in of course, a print is just two dimensional, but uh, it's as much as we can get to convey what we experience as, as, as storytellers. I'm back in it again, and, and I'm able to share with others the enormity that, that is all with us and, and around us. And you mentioned that you sell your images on your website. So how do you choose what images you're going to sell? Well, that's a good question, Paige. Um, so I, because for seven years, I had a physical gallery just up the road here in the Berkshires. When I lived in Indonesia, I had a gallery. Um, and I worked in, you know, with, in collaboration with other gallerists and I, I, I curate not to make everybody happy, but, um, certain things I will just not sell unless, and I'll only ask if you want to print, I will, I will only even consider it. If I ask you, why do you find images of war and death? Uh, important. So let's use, let's say, Eddie Adams' uh, you know, photograph of, of the, in, in Vietnam of the, you know, the, the killing of the, 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 the gentleman during the Vietnam War. Um, if they're a collector of history, then I understand it, uh, and, and so I will. But I, I, I keep all of the, the heavy, <coughs> excuse me, heavy, heavy things off of the website and not in my gallery. But I don't photograph war for I do in the harsh realities of it, but I'm always sort of interested in the strange bizarreness of war. And so the, the periphery is, is, has, a, has a strange, darker um, uh, poetic lyric that um, I think is, is a bit heavier than dead bodies lined up on the ground. So I do curate it. I mean, I could show you briefly uh, let me jump to my website here. Hold on. Um, I'm not trying to sell you my thingy here, but it's a good question that you asked, Paige. Can I share my screen? Yeah. Uh, and I think it's important to mention, I know a lot of photographers will do it through a lab um, and you actually don't. You, you have your images come right to you and then you print them and send them out yourself, which is interesting. Yeah, so so there's a there's a value. Oopsie, we got the this over here. Um, oh, because it went into some crazy big full screen thing. Okay, um, it, there's a there's a value in the art world of the artist actually creating the print, and it also connects that I don't live in New York City to have access to Dugals in New York or in Boston, um, where there's some you know deep, really good printers, but. I want to, I, only I know what it looks like. And, uh, and, and so um, I want to be, I want to give to you the finest print possible of what it actually looked like. And I don't mind taking the effort and the love and the time to present it to you. Um, and when you get your, your studio, as I have here, my studio is actually a living room. 
uh, since I bought this old house, I, I sold the farm that I used to have a, a whole barn was my studio, but I kind of like it here in the house. Um, but it, it'll move into the basement and this floor in the future. But so, so I'll curate, um, you know, like this is migration. Can I make it bigger? Uh, uh, yeah, um, I don't know what size monitor anybody's watching this on. Um, I can show you, you know, images of dead bodies here if you want to um, want to see. Uh, here we go. There's out of Eden migration. You know, people who didn't make it. This is the exact same lava field that this photograph was taken. But to me, just the lost shoe speaks more volumes than this. And uh, and and so I curate it in this more poetic way, I hope, um, not to be, you know, overly clean, um, but, uh, you know, malaria, heavy issues of malaria. Um, but this print from the gallery side, it's probably in its 20th edition already at a, at a relatively large size. I do different sizes, non-edition and edition. Uh, a few years ago, when I started the, the gallery here in, in the Berkshires, I got tired of only catering to the ultra wealthy who could afford expensive, very limited edition prints. And I needed to be democratic and accessible to all. So anything that wasn't already in circulation in editions of like 10 that were you know, starting at five to $10,000 each, I realized, okay, I'm gonna increase the edition to make it accessible. Um, and I'm going to make non-edition prints so for example, the image is uh, you know, 10 by six, and that's printed on uh, eight and a half by 11 uh, juniper paper, and that's $150. And then I'll do, these are non-edition, they're still signed, printed exactly the same way. And then a larger size uh, on, a, on A3 paper, A3 plus paper for 250. Um, and then I have sales during Christmas. I think every photographer should give some love during holidays or any any time, it doesn't have to be a holiday. It could be Hanukkah, it could be Eid al Fitri, it could be you know, Diwali in India is, is taking place soon, have a Diwali sale. Maybe I'll have a Diwali sale. And then I'll um, you know, come in with limited edition prints. And yes, now it starts going into the, you know, the, the collector's world uh, where you have a very exclusive print for $15,000. Um, so I, I I curate it on themes, landscapes, issues, malaria again, um, you know, uh, pollution. Um, this is what we do to our planet. This print, uh, as heavy as it is, uh, I had it in the gallery above a, a water dispenser, like a, you know, you can get free water. And I'll never forget, it was like the second week it opened and this very kind woman was getting water and she looked up and she just stood there and, and stared at this print on the wall. And it was there like just quiet for like 20, 30 seconds. And she said, and I was somewhere in the sitting area or whatever. And she says, I want this print. I want this in my kitchen so that my children can see what we're doing to our earth. And so she gets it. And this, it, it, and this is what I prefer to curate versus uh, more harsher images of pollution, um, war and conflict, Afghanistan. This is uh, in circulation in, in a few, uh, you know, private collectors. So anyway, so it, it, it there, there's a really important sustainability factor um, for photographers uh, in the in the print world. Doesn't mean you have to be a photographer with National Geographic or whatever. I buy prints all the time that I just love it whether they're well-known artists or not. If you're giving love to your images, I'll stop sharing here. Um, if you're giving love to your images through yourself, awareness and, and every fiber of your core being of this temporary existence that I have and you have, we, we all have to give our bodies back. If I feel it, I would be honored to have you here in the house. Um, I want things that touch me and, and there's a value in that. Yeah. Wow. You, so you do have some questions here about um, the prints. Do you varnish your prints? 
Ah, okay. So I'm just learning varnishing because I was talking to Paige a few weeks ago. I want to start making handmade limited edition books. And another opportunity for all of us in these uh, times of, you know, the change in our business. I think there's never been more opportunity than there is today. It's just very different than it used to be. So I, I hope you adapt and be excited and fascinated about everything and, and give to it and, and, and fall into it and make mistakes and pick yourself back up again because every hundred mistakes you make is the classic. I have a hundred new lessons that I learned. So it's all beautiful. And, and so I want to start a very close friend of mine has been making her own um, uh, handmade books, but on newsprint. And, uh, and that's another way of doing it too. Uh, uh, but, uh, so I actually was dabbling oh, and ironically it's that, that print. So uh, I learned, I kind of knew it existed from Moab double-sided paper but double-sided Moab paper. And to um, uh, Wayne's question, um, I am going to uh, varnish these. Is that what it is, right? The, yeah. the, the spray thing. Exactly. Um, because I have done uh, book dummies where I give them to clients or I'll piece a book out hand printed, you know, and just do a, a giant, you know, clip on it to, to hold it together. And the more you thumb it and flip it around, the more you start scratching the pages. Um, so I'm really, really excited. And, and, and I'm gonna test these three papers, uh, the Moab and Trotta rag, na natural and bright white, and the, the, La the LaSalle. And, um, and I am gonna varnish them. And I'm more than happy if you wanna write me on Instagram or you can go to my website and send me a direct message. I'll tell you more on how all of this plays out um, because I'm really, really like, oh my gosh, to start making very rare limited edition handmade books. Uh, there's yeah. a significant market for that. And it all begins in your home, in your studio, in your apartment, in your kitchen. Actually, I have a printer in the kitchen for the, the, the regular printing for, for you know, uh, the documents. Um, there's a there's a dance that we have to expand ourselves, communicate with others, and yes, to 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 make a living. Yeah, um, and it will be the varnish will definitely be handy for books when people actually want to you know touch and feel the prints. So it helps protect against those fingerprints too. The next question you have is: Do you ship um, flat or do you roll it up in a tube? Ah, um, so for the, so this is, uh, this is the double sided, but there's a stack of papers over there and there is the, the, the greeny label people over here is the, the, the juniper. And, uh, so the, the letter size is there and that's what this is. So this is the 10 by six and this I'll ship flat. Um, when I get larger, and I put it in, uh, in, in, I'll show you. Uh, I put it in, uh, oh, I have it all right here. Um, I use a, 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 a glassine paper and, and wrap it in, uh, you know, sort of fold it like an envelope in glassine paper. And then anything larger than uh, the, the, the eight and a half by 11, I do use a shipping tube. Um, and then really wrap it in the glass scene again. Uh, literally, I can do this because these are all just sort of scrappies here, um, like this, right? And then, and then cut it, and then I have many different doll trimmers. Like, get the best, the best trimmers are dolls, they're from Germany, ridiculously expensive. Get them, and you can find them on eBay used sometimes. Uh, I have a 60 inch. Uh, 70 inch uh, trimmer here that is indispensable for the large prints. Um, and you have to do it in shipping tubes. And then I always tell the client who receives them, don't open, don't, I suggest you not to open this tube, uh, bring it straight to the framer uh, because you, inevitably most people don't know how to handle prints. Right. I still can't even handle prints. Yeah. Um, so this is actually interesting. Do you sell your prints with the story to the image? 
Ah, good question. Um, so for the, the larger limited edition prints, the 40 by 30 and the, the 60 by 40, I include a signed copy of the magazine. So this is this month's, next month's issue. Um, so if somebody were to order, you know, this print that we saw earlier um, in that 40 by 60 or, uh, uh, um, uh, or 30 by 40, um, I'll, I'll include a signed uh, copy of the magazine. And if I, you run out of them, you can find them on eBay. So, and then if somebody wants it, uh, inevitably there's a huge secondary market on eBay for every issue of National Geographic. So you can always track them down. I think everyone in the art world, who, every photographer should try uh, if it's, uh, you know, for a small print and all love, uh, you know, for a hundred dollars on a Christmas sale, um, I'll, I'll more than happy to you know tell you which months that this image ran in, but to have a stack of them when you're moving you know a few hundred prints, um, it's just not possible. But yes, it, it, I would suggest any publication that an image has been put in, uh, be kind uh, to those who believe in your work uh, and, and they're buying the value asset. Give some extra love and, and include a, the printed magazine. And what uh, e-commerce site do you use? Uh, I just use uh, the, the Squarespace. Um, and there's an the e-commerce side of Squarespace and does inventory. And look, Paige, and who, who asked this question? Jim, um, I, I am just uh, an absolute non-tech. I'm the anti-tech. I know what I know, and I'm willing to learn what I need to know of the things that I don't know, but I don't want to know everything in the technological side of what we do. Um, and, uh, and, and so there are tools out there that if somebody as, as me can do it, um, I know everyone who has access to a computer uh, as digital numbskully as I am can do it also. Awesome. Um, and can you repeat the name of the trimmer that you use? Uh, doll. Um, it's, this is the, I have many, many versions of it. This is the smaller version of it. Um, it's D-A-H-L-E. Is it backwards, guys? I don't know. D-A-H-L-E. No, uh, and I have three of them. So this is for like the smaller prints. And I have another one that's like a 20 inch trimmer um, and then a, a 60 inch that's like, you know, more than two meters tall, but you need to, to have the, the, the tall one if you're dealing with a, a 60 inch uh, printer. Awesome. And I put that in the chat too, the doll. It's the um, best trimmer. And I bought that, the, the small one here. This is sort of like ridiculous, again, what's ridiculous, but to me, anything that's really expensive is like, oh my God. Uh, but they're made in Germany, super precision. And um, what you might call it, uh, this on, I think from Dahl or any of the online places is like $200. And I found this on eBay for $89. It's great. It had a few little scratches on it. The others I bought new, the 60 inches is pretty, pretty ridiculously expensive, but one print sale will, will pay for it. Yep. So we're going to finish up with a few more of these questions that I have. Um, this one's another technical one, and then you have some more inspirational questions, but do you print from Lightroom or your printer? Ah, uh, I can show you. Uh, <laughs> I'll share the screen. Oh, you know, I should put paper in the in the printer. Hold on, am I still here? Hi. Um, so I go over here. And here's the. So this is again. I'm not here to you know do paper, but this is the one I use, the Juniper Barada Barita Barada, um, and uh, so. You just got to feel which is the surface side of it. There it is. And uh, 
one over here. And so I'll share my screen here now. Um, am I sharing? Okay. Yes. And so I do it out of Lightroom. Uh, and those of you on Lightroom, what do we want to print? Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Let's try something I haven't printed before. Uh, uh, all right, this one. Um, and so if you're in Lightroom and you're using Canon, I know there's a lot of printers out there with like HP and uh, well, they're all the printers out there, but let, let's, oh, Epson is the other one. And I guess there's others too. But I use Canon because I, I just know it so well and the output is just like zinc. And in the Canon universe, there's a plugin. And if you're gonna use the, the whatever it's called, the Pro 1000 or whatever, um, you want to use this plugin called the Canon Print Studio Pro. And so you come up here and you do this and and of course you want to tone it the way you tone it, right? Let me move this away. Whoopsie daisies. Um, so there's the, you know, you'll, I'll, I'll be in light. Can I go back in Lightroom? Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, it's toned in my settings and whatnot, whatnot. It does look a little bit yellowish here, but anyway, maybe it's just my eyeballs, but I have a, a light over here just so that you see me. Otherwise it's too dark in this room. And, um, and so everything is, is preset because I'm always printing this paper, although I did have to quickly reset this because I printed those double-sided papers, which are a different profile or media type. And I have the, the ICC profile in here already from, uh, and, and Moab has it for every paper and it's on their website and it's super easy to do. And again, like blah, 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 blah. Uh, if I can do it, anybody, my, Elfrida, my dog, Frida, my dog could do this. Um, and letter size, and it has all bumpty, bumpty, bumpties uh, and layout. And, you know, it's all, I always set this to 10 inches for those prints. There we go, zinc. And it, when you have it dialed in, it's literally this. And I press that and I choose it here. I think one of my inks are getting a little low. Yeah, but we have enough um, print and it'll go and in a matter of two or three seconds wirelessly, it goes back to that printer and um, and it does its thing. Um, so I do it all out of Lightroom with this plugin. You have to close it. It's like a separate uh, application. Um, and when you have your work toned, uh, for example, this image, I know what I see is what I get. So there's an acronym for that, right? W WYSIWYG. Um, uh, and so there's an acronym <clears throat> and I have it set up on an Apple monitor. Uh, you want to have a good monitor. Uh, the new MacBook Pros, even the present MacBook Pros, but the new ones they just announced just seem magical. Um, it, it, I don't know in the PC world, um, but if you're on a Mac monitor, you're pretty much firm. Um, and I get what I see here is what comes out over there or what comes out over there with, without any, oh, you're not seeing what I was doing. Uh, what, what I print over here <laughs> or over here uh, comes out exactly um, you know, what it is. And I think these next questions kind of go, this kind of takes away from the printing, but there actually is one more printing question. Oh, um, do you, I hope I'm not boring anyone. Or do we have people still here? <laughs> we do. Um, do you ever use Epson print layout? Never heard of it. I'm sure there's other things out there. And, and because I'm on, a, on Canon printers, um, it just is yeah. what it is. I don't know. I mean, whatever works for you, right? It, it, Again, all these are just tools. If you like a certain kind of hammer, use the hammer that you do. You like a certain kind of sewing machine, do it. You like a certain kind of shovel to do gardening with your you know, asparagus, use that shovel. It doesn't have to be what I use. It's what you give through it. But in this case, 
it is sort of an essence of it's so seamless and the outcome on this again not trying to talk about moab uh, but it just comes out beautifully it's exactly dimensionally what i'm seeing that's great um, so these two questions, I actually think this is perfect to end on, but these two questions kind of come hand in hand. Um, so I'm going to read both questions. When you arrive at a new place for a story, how do you go about looking for images for the story? Do you have a narrative in mind before um, reaching? Also, do you struggle at times with images? And the other question was, um, how to keep your energy up on assignment day after day, week after week? Does your photographic eye ever get tired? Wow, that's a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> oh, they're all beautiful. Um, I, I wish I could see these questions. Oh, here it is. I can see it now. Um, when you arrive at a new place for a story, how do you go about looking for the images of the story? Uh, do you have a narrative in mind before reaching? Oh, so there's multiple questions within one question. Okay. Smutri. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, smooth. Uh, sm sm I'm going to just go with Puad. Um, uh, so do I go looking for the images of the story? Um, I have a basic knowledge. I, I research quite a bit before going. A lot, actually. But you do reach a point of you can read all the books you want, all the academic aspects that you could ever imagine you could have even been to the place before you could even be living in the place that you are going to be photographing in and and i lived half my life out of this country and, and lived in uh, indonesia and china and grew up in the bahamas and lived in italy and spain and france that the you don't know anything until you're there on the ground, even as you walk out the door of your home, until your mind is in the movement of that story. So I don't care if you came from another planet or you walked out your front door. You walk out your front door every day and are you in tune with the world around you? Not necessarily so, right? You're running errands, you're getting eggs, you're getting you know, I don't know, vegetables. Um, uh, you have to walk into that dimensional space of why you're there, even in your own backyard. Um, and so I, I have a certain amount of knowledge, as much as I could pour into myself until it's like, what more am I doing here? Uh, I need to live it. I need to go out my door, whether it's right here in Great Barrington and in, in the Berkshires or right out in Bangalore, uh, in, in, in Chennai or something like that, um, or a village in Chennai. Uh, even if I've been to the village before, I still have to be in that space. And, uh, and I'm more like feeling the images and with the narrative in my mind, but I don't expect anything. I don't go with any preconceived, oh, here's your question. Do you have a narrative in my, yeah, so there's a narrative thread, like, but I am going to be distracted, as I mentioned before. Uh, if I see something, you know, insects moving around on the ground, I'm going to start filming that or I'm going to start photographing it. And the insects, I'm not doing a story on entomology or anything to do with animals or anything like that or insects. I'm just allowing myself to be taken into the you know, it's like looking at a, well, this isn't a glass, but, you know, as if this was glass, even here, like, look at all the reflections, the red light and the, and the stripes here that are coming in and the, uh, the sound that it makes. I'll just get lost in this stuff. Well, there's even a real, like, line on the inside. Look at that, how it continues up and bends and goes over the top. It's just incredible. There's so many lines on this side, too. What do you see over here? Um, and so I'll go... I guess I should be telling you, but this is what I do. I get distracted. And these distractions, though, help me understand the narrative that I'm talking about. I hope I'm talking clearly here, but yeah. what I'm trying to photograph. Um, and do I struggle at times with the images? Uh, Puhan, I struggle all the time, all the time. My God, I mean, like a constant struggle. And um, I would almost, 
have to share that if you're not struggling, you're not going deep enough. You're just make, you're just like doing a picture. I want you to make a picture. I want you to give to it. And, and it could be torment. It could be torture, uh, internal torture, not, not, not physical torture. It can be physical too. If you're like my friend, Jimmy Chen, who climbs, you know, sides of mountains and things like that. Um, but, uh, if I'm not in a, a struggling, then I'm only reaching the fruit that has already fallen on the ground, or it's just too easy. The magic and the beauty and the unknown is in the discovery through the struggle. And uh, so I struggle all the time. Nothing, nothing lands on my lap. Uh, and if it is, it's, um, it, 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 it isn't, as brilliant as it could be or giving as it could be without the struggle. Yeah. Wow. So I think we'll kind of wrap it up and I think you should um, tell everyone what you have coming up. What should people be looking out next from you? I know that you have the National Geographic story coming out in November or it, you said it just did come out, but they can look for the next chapter of that. And then um, anything else that people should be looking for from you? Uh, so yeah, so uh, not, I'm not here to promote really anything. I'd actually rather promote Paul's incredible words in this month's issue. I hope you read Paul's prose. Uh, he's the most prolific writer I've ever had the honor to work with. Uh, and he's just such a humble human being. And so I hope you, you read uh, the, the latest issue, it's the, you know, it's everywhere on the planet in 29 different languages. Um, what else is going on? Uh, I have three books coming out, but not until 20. Oh, we have Indonesia. Terima kasih. Ah, Irwan. Joshua is, is I'm, I'm going to be collaborating with, with Joshua. Apa kabar? You bike? Um, oh, wow. So beautiful. Um, and uh, so first of a series of books, uh, the Out of Eden books uh, through Nat Geo Books, also a, a monograph uh, through Nat Geo Books also. Uh, um, I have a workshop in Tanzania coming up in March. Uh, I am going to start doing these, uh, you know, uh, handmade, uh, personally printed um, books. Um, I don't know when I'm going to get around to that, but hopefully come back to Armenia. Oh, I want to go back to Armenia. Oh my God. You don't understand. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, so uh, there's always something going on. Um, yeah. We'll be going to China soon, Tanzania, this, this event in Tanzania. And um it's all books right now. Like everything is a saturation, uh, very thankful. But uh, you, we, we have a thing at the geographic where if, uh, if, if you're gonna do a book and 50% of the images or more were published in the magazine, you have to uh, present it to National Geographic Books for first right of refusal. And I am, was planning about seven books over the next five years um, and all of them had some content uh, in uh, of National Geographic, except I think one, and uh, and they didn't refuse four of them. So uh, so I'm very thankful. But now is this sort of um, move of uh, of the um, of those books and layouts and all of that. Uh, do a holiday print sale, so that connects to printing and paper. Uh, I, I really can't stress enough, uh, whoever is still here, and, and if you're a working photographer or aspiring photographer, don't miss the opportunity of offering your work as tangibles. Uh, it, it, it's an act of giving. Uh, even if it's not a huge amount of money for a print for a hundred dollars or fifty dollars after you spend you know a significant amount of money on a printer like this or you know much more on a larger printer it's all an act of giving and in giving it returns to you and uh, the world wants to see your work and and get the best printer use the best paper you can possibly use and uh, I'm 
just just this unbelievableness of juniper that I, I can't get enough of and uh, and give to your the people that believe in you and believe in your work um, they want to have your your history your art on their on your walls and uh, and and so don't um, don't lose that ability to give something to me to Paige, to everyone here who, who's kindly uh, messaged and who's not messaged, but I know, I hope you're still here. Um, it's an important part of our giving and our uh, lateral uh, work that we do in photography. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and thanks everyone for joining. This will be um, post on our YouTube channel. So if there's something that you miss and want to go back, um, we'll send an email when it's available on there. And thank you, John, so much for your time. You've been, uh, Paige, you've been wonderful. Thank you. Sorry, so somebody else's name here is Kent. And I mm -hmm. Paige, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who was here. And um, be wonderful. Yes. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.